Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the West Coast sweep has been completed. The Calgary Flames won all four of their road games on the West Coast, and now they're coming back here to finish off the last 10 games of the season. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Uh, Matt, were you expecting this to be a total sweep? Well, looking at the caliber of the Flames' opponents, uh, it frankly looked like they should win the last three just because like all of those teams have given up. They sold heavily at the deadline. And it, you know, it's basically looking like uh, preseason rosters for those teams. And yeah, so, you predicted a win against everyone but San Jose. Yeah. Um, so LA uh, was basically the only team that really seemed to be like like if the Flames were gonna have difficulties this week, LA I I think would have been the one to be concerned about but the flames managed to hold them off for the win and collected three more well let's jump into that la game this is a proverbial four-point game against a team that was right behind the flames in the pacific division um some odd officiating this one but the calgary flames ended up coming up with a three to two win in regulation against the la kings here so uh overall what were your thoughts on this game matt i thought the flames played a responsible enough game um as you said, the officiating was a bit weird at times in this contest, but uh, Calgary did enough to shut the other team down when they needed to. And, it, you know, it wasn't the prettiest of games, but they were effective and they got the win, which that at the end of the day is the part that matters. I thought in this one, the and, and obviously all three Flames goals came from the top line, Um I would say all the points came to the top line, but that's not quite true. The last Goudreau goal had Carpenter and Stone assist on it. But this was a game where I thought that the Flames' best people looked really good. and Or I wouldn't say really good, but as good as they've looked all season. And I'd say that maybe the middle six of the team didn't look all that great. I think the most of this team still looked like they were recovering from that slump this team had been in. Yeah, and frankly, since the beginning of March, the second and third lines have been kind of off their game entirely. Um, more or less since Tyler Toffoli joined the club, which I'm not blaming him for that. It's just that everybody seems to be out of sequence in the middle six in terms of generating offense. And like we saw or later in the week, Blake Coleman getting a goal. And like that was like his second goal in 20 games. Like it, Manjapanio, I think, only has two goals since the beginning of March. Like it's... You know, like all of those guys are more or less out of whack in terms of their typical performance. And, you know, it was emblematic in this game where they all struggled. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that there's definitely been some changes to the lineup. There's been some changes since Toffoli came in, um, I, even more changes since Yarn Croak joined. Obviously, he wasn't in the lineup in this one, but I think just more shuffling going on and maybe guys feel a little uneasy. And Matt, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but maybe also guys feeling like maybe they've lost their spot. I mean, when Toffoli came into the second line, somebody had to move down to the third line, and that's probably caused a little bit of, um, I, don't, I don't want to say consternation, but maybe a few guys feeling like they... Um, aren't where they should be. Yeah, and it's also like now getting used to new line mates and refining that chemistry, which that's why it was very important for that to fully deal to happen sooner than later, um, just due to the fact that, uh, you know, these type of struggles are fairly common after trades, and that's why uh, typically like teams that, actually do play well into the playoffs and that are adding at the fringes of their team not uh core ish pieces but if you're gonna add a core piece like to fully it's better to get that done sooner than later and tree tree did say that part of the reason we did the to deal early is that we had that time for the team to adjust to it you know, he said that when you do that deal on deadline day, it often takes too long, but getting it done, what, that was almost a month before the deadline, I think, the Toffoli deal. Yeah, and like now like there are 10 games left, which basically the mantra for those 10 games is like getting everybody ready to go for a puck drop of game one against whomever we're playing. Well, before we can get to the puck drop, let's finish out this uh, California sweep. So the Flames had 
Tuesday off, and then on Wednesday they went to Anaheim, the the arena that we never used to be able to do well in. How long did that Honda Center curse last? Do you remember? Well, uh, from the year 2000, we had a drought from then till 2004 when we won one game, and then it wasn't until like a couple years ago, uh, 2019, I think, that they finally broke Let's that. Let's just call so. it a 19-year drought. Mm-hmm. We'll round up. Um, the Flames went to what used to be the Honda Center, isn't anymore, and ended up getting a big win in that one. Uh, the Calgary Flames got a 4-2 win over the Ducks. I didn't think that the Flames played their A game in the first, but they definitely found a way to win um, this game. And I think this is – the Flames didn't play their A game, but I think the win is also probably a testament to the, let's call it, depleted roster of the Anaheim Ducks. Yeah, like if Anaheim was at full strength, I think that the score might have been different and not in the Flames' favor. But, yeah, like when you're, you lose guys like Hampus Lindholm – and Ricard Raquel, who's a noted Flames killer, you know, like that's going to make your team significantly weaker no matter who you are. And, you know, the Ducks just are in that, you know, like the 2013 2014 edition of the Flames mode where they have a couple of good young players on the team and you're just playing out the string waiting for new draft picks to come join your team. Trevor, or sorry, Michael Stone. I was looking at uh, Trevor Zegers' name on the score sheet, but Michael Stone got his first goal of the year in this game, scoring in the third period to put the Flames up 3-1. to one. Um, Not the guy I would have expected to score, but as we've always said, and I think we saw in the LA game, we'll talk about it again after this road trip, but a guy who's always able to step in the lineup, no matter how long it's been since he's played, and just looks like he belongs there, doesn't he? Yeah, well, and the thing is is that he actually brings a different dimension than any of the other defensemen in the lineup, and that is that booming slap shot. Like, Anderson and Hannafin both have decent slap shots, but not anywhere near the caliber of Stones. Um, You'd probably much have to go back to Dennis Weidman for the last time the Flames had a defenseman with that caliber of slapper. And... You know, that's a very useful tool for this team, like especially when we're getting into the playoffs of perhaps you might see Stone drawing into the lineup just for his utilization on the power play um, because of that, because it does bring a whole different dimension. And that slapper not only got him the goal, but also got him an assist. He got an assist in the game before this as well. Um, Stone assist on the Lindholm goal. But yeah, even if he's not, you know, and the thing about Stone there's some defensemen that have a slapper, but they're not really accurate. And they just kind of put it towards the net for the forwards to have to dig out of the corner and stuff like that. I'm sure you, we can both think of some guys that have that. Uh, Stone is pretty accurate. Like, he puts it on net, and if it doesn't go in, one of the forwards can generally usually tap it in. Yeah, and it creates havoc any which way. Like, it, either the goalie is forced to make a good save, there's tip possibilities, there's loose pucks... Uh, you know, it hits one of the defensemen, uh, you know, any of the those things. Like, it just creates a problem for the other team. Where before, when Calgary didn't really have that available to them, like, it, the Flames' power play, like, especially the second unit, became very easy to defend against because basically you're looking at the three forwards making passing plays with, you know, limited contributions from the point now you actually have a legit weapon from the blue line and that does create space for everybody else on the power play and it's something you're going to need as we move forward as we look as you said earlier towards round one you need to have different guys you can slot in different times and i think now that we're getting Michael Stone going, and I mean, we'll talk more about it in the San Jose game in just a second, but now that we're getting him going and a few other guys maybe in and out of that uh, back six, I think you're going to see the Flames play different defensemen based on what they're looking for that night and play different defensemen just to keep their first-round opponent on their toes and give them different looks. Yeah, like it, it, it's one of those situations where like, if you need more of a physical presence, having a guy like Nikita Zadorov draw in, as your 5'6 guy uh, to exact a pound of flesh makes a lot of sense. If you're needing more offense from your game, having Stone in there makes more sense. It just depends. 
but having that flexibility will be huge for this team going into game one. Well, let's move on to the next game. The following night on Thursday, the Calgary Flames went to San Jose to play the second of a back-to-back. Dan Vladar was in net, and they scored a, four goals in this one to win 4-2. to two. That's eight goals in two nights for this team. Pretty impressive. Uh, Calgary Flames goals from Matthew Kachuk, Trevor Lewis, Elias Lindholm, and Elias Lindholm again. So, good game here. Notably, a lineup change. Um, Zadorov and Goodbranson were both out. Mackie and Valamaki were both in on this one, which is kind of interesting. And also Richie back in the lineup as well. What were your thoughts to start off with, with that bottom pair of Mackie Valamaki? Well, I, frankly, I was glad to see that uh, good Branson and Zadorov got a game off. Um, I think you'll start to see some players rotating in and out of the lineup that you know, wouldn't normally so just moving down the stretch, just because you want everybody fresh for game one, you're also wanting to see what you know guys like Val Mackey and Mackey can do in case of injuries in the playoffs, because you don't want to fly blind and go, okay, well, uh, one of you has got to go in. Um, so and, at least, and we'll talk more about their play in just a little bit. Yeah, and um, but I thought that uh, both uh, Val Mackey and Mackey played adequately i think that mackie was the better defender of the two um I agree. and you know i think val mackie needs probably another full year in the ahl before he can uh return to the nhl lineup but that's you know whenever a player loses like two years of worth of games due to injury that kind of thing happens anything specific about this game you want to talk about i think it was it was kind of when we saw I don't know. When I saw the Flames start to play this one, I thought, yeah, this is the game we're going to get. Like, as I started to see the team in the first and then into the second, I thought, yeah, that's that's what we're going to get from these guys is a big win tonight. Yeah. And, like, they didn't really have too much danger from San Jose. Like, no. yeah, the Sharks did score a couple of goals, but, like, it never really seemed, you know, it's like if the Flames needed to, they could have found another gear and like put it on but there was no need to and you know um an interesting stat with the win in this game they actually moved to seven four and one on the third game of a three game and four night thing and then the next game moved to eight four and one which to me is one of the most impressive stats i've heard about this team well, another impressive stat on this one is I believe since we've had all the California teams we have now, this is the first time the Flames have swept the California road trip. I know. It's like, um, where am so I? That'd be what, like 92 when San Jose? Yeah, probably 92. No, 93, no, 94 yeah. uh, when Anaheim came in. That's Cause, right. Cause yeah, we I was were, trying to think who came in first. Yeah, we were kind of okay against Anaheim right off the hop for a couple of years when they were like, before basically Paul Korea and uh, Team Muslani joined up and then yeah we didn't really win after that <laughs> so you know it it took a while <laughs> another milestone for this team and what's becoming a milestone year for the flames yep and then the flames uh for once did not play on a friday which was kind of odd it feels like we've had a lot of friday games lately um i guess we didn't play the week before but it feels like we've had a lot of friday games and a nice early uh, Saturday game for us at 5 p.m. start time. Matt, it was weird to have the hockey game done and the sun's still out. I know. It's There's like you can tell you're getting start time. You can tell you're getting to the end of the season and towards the playoffs when there's still daylight after the game. That's right. I remember watching some of the games when we've gone late, and it's like, wow, it's the game's over. There's been like an overtime period, and it's still light out. This is crazy. It doesn't feel like hockey season. Yeah. Um, so the flames took that night off, went to Seattle and played in the climate pledge arena. Their, um, their 4 PM local start time, 5 PM Calgary and a big win for the flames here Four one flames got goals from Coleman, Lewis stone again, and to Foley. Um, I think this is pretty much we, what we expected here. Wasn't it? Yeah. Well, basically you're facing an exhibition caliber team like preseason caliber team and you know one that's not playing all their veterans and you have the calgary flames like calgary didn't really try in this game at all and yet still won four to one 
And I know. thought after I thought they came out hard in this one. After Coleman's goal, I thought they kind of fell apart in the first. They didn't look all that great, but then they came back in the second and I thought really took the game over. Yeah, it this was one of those games where you basically got a break while playing a game like cuz the caliber of the opponent was so like there was so much of a gulf between the two teams that like Calgary didn't really need to put a hundred percent effort to run over the other team for sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, as much as we've talked about the flames playing down to their opponents in the past, I think that there's also times where, especially this late in the season, you have to realize when you can sort of preserve your energy. Yeah. And I think this is probably one of those games where they had to put in just enough energy to win, but not overexert themselves. Yeah. And that's why I like the games, um, like the coming up against Seattle, Arizona, Chicago, uh, Winnipeg, and Vancouver are all very important because of the fact that they can kind of rest on the fly. It's an interesting way of looking at it, yeah. So we said last week that a road trip might do this team some good, and it looks like it has done this team some good. They got four wins in four games. They swept the West Coast. And they now sit firmly atop the Pacific Division. While they haven't officially clinched, um, I think it's safe to say that they are going to be number one in the Pacific. Right now, after 72 games, the Flames have 44 wins, 19 losses, 9 overtime losses for a total of 97 points. Right behind us is the Edmonton Oilers at 90 and the Los Angeles Kings at 86. So, Matt, I think we can... Let's knock on wood when we say this, but I think at this point we can officially say that uh, the Flames have wrapped up the Pacific. Yeah, like Edmonton's realistically the only team that can catch Calgary, and like the maximum amount of points that they can get is 108, which if the Flames go 5-4-1, and one, we still win the division. So, like, it's, you know, and that's with Edmonton going on like an insane terror, going 9-0 and to finish the year, which, you know, could happen, but extremely doubtful. So, you know, like, it's really getting to the end point. And, you know, like, especially, like, if the Flames are victorious against um, Seattle and Arizona this week, uh, you know, like, it, you're already at 101. Like, Edmonton's going to be hard-pressed to get over 100 points. So it's... Calgary has 10 games left, and four of them are against teams currently in playoff spots. So a great way to make up some points here in the last few weeks of the season. Yeah. Actually, if the Flames go six and four, they'll actually tie their best ever uh, season, which is eighty-eight, eighty-nine, with one hundred and nine. So that points. means we have to go, what seven and three, or six three and one. I was going to say, or six three and one, and go one over. Yep. Well, with that, Matt, it's interesting stat now. The Cal- And I can't remember any other time this happened, and, and obviously never with 32 teams, but um, the Calgary Flames now have at least one point against every other team in the league. Yeah. We can't say that with anyone else because it's the first year we've had a 32-team league, but uh, impressive there that, I mean, we've always seen years where we just get skunked by somebody. Like, I remember the years that we couldn't win a Battle of Alberta. Or, you know, we couldn't win against certain teams. I, I remember there's a couple of years where Winnipeg had our number. Yep. Like, as much as we've had teams beat us, we're at least squeaking out at least one point against everybody, which is awesome. Yeah. And uh, th- I think that shows the mark of, like, Calgary turning the corner and being an elite team where, like, it doesn't matter who you are, we can beat you. For sure, yeah. And, and we saw it this week again as well. I mean, not only can we beat them, we... F- I shouldn't say we, we're not on the team, but not only can the Flames beat them, the Flames are finding different ways to win. And they're learning how to capitalize on each team's weaknesses and what they have to do. It's not, as we've seen from the Flames in the past, where this is our game, and if you shut it down, we're done. They're finding different ways to win, and that's what good teams do. Yeah, and, you know, all, like also um, being able to manage games, like the last three, like all three of those teams are bad. And they didn't need to go and give 100% effort in those games. And they didn't. And and they were able to save a little bit of gas at the end of the night, which makes a difference, especially with the amount of games that they have to play. Like, they still have 10 more games in the next 20 days. Uh, You know, like, that's a lot of hockey still left to play. 
and you know that by the end of the season like they you know that they they're gonna have a little bit of a hard time just getting through all of that and then getting ready for the playoffs and so anytime you can manage games where like the opponent's not that big a deal um that you can you know not overly test yourself so that way, when the games actually do matter, like the two Nashville games or the Dallas game or the Minnesota game, you know, like those are the important ones for the rest of the season. So like they can be fresh and ready to go for those ones. I think that about wraps up this trip. Anything else about the trip you want to talk about, Matt? Uh, not really. Um, just uh, congrats to Gaudreau for tying his career high with 99 points. And thanks to him for not scoring against uh, Seattle. So that way the fans in the Saddle Dome over the next three games, I'm assuming he gets a point somewhere this week. So He's got to. I mean, if you, if you play Seattle, Vegas, Arizona, and don't get one point, yeah, that's going to be crazy. And I'm hoping it's a goal. I mean, no one wants to really celebrate that on an assist if you're a fan. Yeah, and it'll be the first time since Theo Fleury in 92-93 that a Flames has clipped the 100-point mark. So that'll be a huge thing. Uh, just for Matt, do you think we could convince him to just keep taking one year deals and he's always in a contract year and plays yeah. as well? We'll guarantee you this amount of money and we'll sign you even though <laughs> you know, but just keep doing your thing, man. <laughs> That's right. Every year's a contract year. Um, let's talk a little bit about the blue line. We saw some changes to the blue line this week, as we know the flames uh have changed the blue line a little bit. Connor Mackey played with Chris Tanev most of the week. We saw Vala Mackey and Stone on the on the last pair uh, late in the week. But some some interesting changes here. And I think interesting to also note that Connor Mackey seems to have jumped over Rasmus or uh, Yusuf Vala Mackey in the depth chart. So let's break these guys down one at a time. Yeah. Connor Mackey, I think, of the two, looks more NHL ready. When you're looking at Mackey, do you look at him as being a guy who could probably jump onto an NHL top six right now? Yeah, I think that like if the Flames, like starting next season, had him as the 5-6 guy, I'd be like, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Not a problem. You know, and like I that agree. would be a way to save some cap money as well uh, with both Good Branson and um, Zadorov being free agents at the end of the year. And them needing to spend some money on certain other players, uh, him, um, <laughs> you know, that, uh, you know, having a guy like Mackey who is legitimately looking like a top four, six defenseman. And even then, I'd even say that Michael Stone has looked like he's deserving of a contract for next year, which you we were expecting that anyway, because it's Stone, you know. Michael Stone's going to be here until this team is gone or until michael stone's gone yeah exactly like, michael stone will be one of those guys remember do you remember that movie office space that guy who doesn't work there anymore but keeps coming to work michael stone will like retire and just keep coming in for the player meals and lunches and skates yeah. and stuff and no one will even realize he's retired yeah it's like oh hey mike how's it going <laughs> you know the, the, the everybody's like yeah players okay. they're drafted in 2025 will go who's that guy oh that's just stone yeah he's just here <laughs> that's right he's older than the head coach but he's still here doesn't um, matter yeah so no i i would i would agree with you and, and we'll come back to stone well let's jump right to stone then so i agree with you that Mackey is nhl ready i think i wouldn't be surprised to see them carry him into the playoffs as their extra forward if they need to but i think that michael stone can also do that and we've talked a lot coming into the deadline about should the flames get another defenseman do they need some depth there I think Michael Stone proved why Tree didn't need to spend an asset. And I was one of the people that I admit said Tree should probably get a defenseman. Stone has looked great. I mean, is he a top four? Maybe not. But for a guy that hasn't played in how long, he's come in, he's got almost a point every game he's been in since he's back in the lineup. He's not a defensive liability, which you often see from those kind of guys that have the big shot. I mean, he looks like a 5'6 a, a NHLer. Yeah, he basically looks like the guy that we gave that huge contract extension to a couple of years ago. Uh, that multi-year deal, not the one-offs that since then. And, and you know, like a legit number four or five guy. And you know, if the Flames can, you know, keep him um, beyond this season, 
you know, he would definitely be a serviceable 5-6 guy. And if you're looking at, like, saving some money while having a veteran guy, that would definitely be a, a serviceable option to you, especially with having Mackie there as well. Like, you're not going to see a huge step down in terms of the level of play from Stone and Mackey to from good uh, Zadorov and Goodbranson while saving, like, $5 million, $6 million, which can go to Gaudreau or Kachuk. I think that not only next year, like you said, but I think even this year, I think I would probably be playing Stone, finding a way to put him in the lineup from here on out. I think maybe if you sit Good Branson or you sit Zadorov, I don't think it's going to really matter all that much from here on out. And I think getting Stone going and ready for a spot in the playoffs is probably the best utilization of him. Yeah, uh, frankly, I would sit Zadorov because um, Good Branson's a good penalty I would killer too. and. Uh, Stone's a good penalty killer, so that gives multiple options in case, say, one of them's in the penalty box that you have the other guy available um, and you're not playing weird people that you're not used to on the penalty kill and, you know, like all that kind of thing. I'm much more confident. Like, I expected Michael Stone to come in. I expected him to be a good number six, do his job, all that. I did not expect him to get a goal, much less, what I think, three assists this week. Like, he's outperforming my expectations as the fill-in guy. How about you? Oh, for sure. Like, he's looking more like the guy that we acquired. And And we paid a third and a conditional fifth for. Yeah, and who was actually a solid top-pairing defenseman with uh, Arizona. Mind you, it is Arizona, so a top pairing for them is like a 3-4 guy for us. <laughs> but, you know, it's one of those. Like, he's looked very effective, and, you know, like, if Shillington's out for, you know, a longer period of time, having him as the number three with Tanev, uh, he's filling in on that spot rather well. Yeah, no, and I think right now, I don't know about you, but if I had to pick Stone or Mackey in the lineup, I think it would be Stone right now. Yeah, for sure. And then let's talk about Yuso Valamaki. I mean, this is a player the Flames drafted high. He's been injured a lot, and as you and I know, he really hasn't played a full NHL season, and you and I talked about this last year before the start of the um, the shortened lockout season, or sorry, not lockout, but uh, COVID season, and... You know, I think that this is a guy who maybe his development has been stunted because of how many injuries he's had. Not just not having a chance to play, but I think physically. And we see that with players once in a while. They, they're they stunted that way too. But I think right now, and you mentioned it earlier, Valamaki still needs some AHL seasoning. Yeah, it's one of those that like he's making mistakes that he shouldn't at the this stage of his development curve. Um, like if he was healthy the entire time, you'd be going, okay, this guy's clearly a bust and get rid of him. Sort of like Vancouver did with Oliu Olivi. But, um, you know, like it, he's just not confident at all out there. Uh, he was trying too hard. I thought in the San Jose game to not make mistakes and like, he wasn't being mindful of his time on ice and he was taking too long of shifts and, just trying to do too much to impress Daryl, which had the opposite effect of, you know, he getting pulled from the lineup and then sent down. And I think that, yeah. you know, like he, I think he had a bit of an ego problem uh, where like he just thought, oh, I'm going to be the bestest, best player ever. I'm a high pick. I'm entitled to an NHL spot. Yeah. And that bad attitude and like him fighting with Daryl earlier in this season, which, you know, got him pulled out of the lineup and, you know, um, it's one of, you know, and like, uh, calling the team stupid for not playing them, uh, you know, Oh yeah. I forgot about that. You know, and it's like, um, you actually have to do the effort and work to actually get in the lineup. Nothing's actually given to you. And if you have that attitude, you know, like, you have to kind of check yourself. Like you're not an NHL player right now. And unless he gets out of his own way, he might derail his entire future just because, you know, thinking he's too good. And 
you know. I think he got a game suspension or something in the AHL as well. I'd have to look up if it was a full game for unsportsmanlike conduct. So, yeah, probably definitely a guy who's got a little bit of an ego to him. Yeah, which that's fine as long as you're willing to put the effort and the it, all the details in. And, you know, like we even saw in the past, like a guy like Dion Phaneuf who thought he was just all that and then some, and then he never actually progressed from his rookie year. And, like, his entire career was kind of a disappointment from what potential he had because he, his attitude and ego got in the way. And, you know, Valley might be suffering from a bit of the same problem. And, like, Valimaki could be a top-pairing defenseman. Like, he does have that skill set and the height and the skating ability where, you know, that is a realistic destination for him. But he have to do the work, and right now we're not seeing that. And you know, anytime a player is butting his head with the coaches too much, it's like, um, you know, perhaps the organization's not actually needing this player in the organization. Which I would not be surprised when we're looking if, like, in the future, like at the draft, that I would not be surprised if Al is included in a trade. I was going to go there. So if we take a look, I think there's probably two spots available on the Flames blue line potentially next year. Do you think that's yeah. reasonable to say? Yeah, five, six, yeah. Do you think it's reasonable to say that Stone and Mackie are probably both ahead of Valimaki oh, for, for those sure. spots? Yeah, for sure. So in that case, I believe that Valimaki, I'm 90% sure, but I'm just looking it up here. Yeah, he is. He's waiver eligible next year. I don't think he clears waivers, so I agree with you. I think maybe the best thing for Valimaki is a change of scenery, and I think that there's still a lot of teams that would like that piece, especially if they have room for him in the NHL. I'm going to be very surprised if Valimaki is still in the Flames organization come training camp. I am too, and you know, not like- that he's not that he's a bad player. I just don't think that he fits right now, and I think that there's value to be had from moving him. Well, um, just uh, you know. Cro- cross sports uh, for a minute like the Jays just traded one of their backup catchers last week for another catcher just because that player could be sent to the minors where the guy that they traded couldn't and I think that basically like you know moving Valimaki it makes sense because like he has to be in the NHL and like right now like it just makes zero sense for him to be in the, the NHL uh, based off of and you know playing. you you were using the Jays example of getting another catcher I mean the Flames are short on draft picks I think you could probably even flip them for a pick yeah and you'd probably only get the a best move yeah you'd probably only get a third or something but at that point that's worth it and you know the other thing I could see him being used for is if you needed to give a sweetener for somebody to take like the Lucic deal yeah I agree I could see him being a useful part of that I could see Dubé being a useful part of that too Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you're willing to include them both, Dubé and Valimaki, you could probably even get an asset back, a roster player back for that yeah. package if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, I'm. I think that Valimaki is has been passed. I think he needs more seasoning. Um, and, and I just I don't know that Calgary's the right spot for him with what we have on the blue line. I think that's a you know a blessing for us that we don't need to rush him in there, put him in there just because he's the high pick and good on our scouts for finding uh, Connor Mackey. Who's a, a college free agent. They brought in. I mean, we've had good luck with college guys in the past, but yeah, I, I wouldn't not that Valama. And again, I'm not trying to say Valamaki's not good or shouldn't be here. I just think that, you know what the, there's more value to him in the organization right now as a trade chip. I agree. And you know, like, looking forward to, like, the draft and, like, even the past couple drafts, like, the Flames have been selecting defensemen over the last couple of years, and, you know, like, those guys are starting to filter in through the organization, and it's really useful that you have guys like Hannafin, Anderson, and Shillington, who are all under the age of 25, who are literally your top four defensemen. Um, because like, oh, you need a five, six guy. Well, you know, go spend like 2 million bucks and you can get a good five, six guy, like good Branson's $2 million. Like that's, you yeah, know, 
And I think there's a spot for veterans, and that's another reason I would say if they're going to go out and get a seven, bring in a guy with some veteran experience as we saw this year. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, I I just I don't see where Valimaki fits. And I think we'd both agree if he's on waivers, he'll get claimed. Oh, for sure. Well, you know, you're looking at, like, a team like Arizona, for example. They need bodies. You know, Seattle needs bodies. So, you know, they'd be like, oh, you're a young defenseman who's taken in the first round. Sure, come play. You know, even if you're embarrassingly bad, yay, who cares? You know, you're- well, and I think no, those two are great examples, but I think there's a lot of markets. I could even see, you know, Philadelphia potentially is the yeah. one that's been in my head, but there's a lot of markets I could see taking. How often do we see first round picks get more chances than maybe they should because they're a first round pick and, you know, somebody thinks that they can be their reclamation project? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Valimaki would be on the, near the top of my list if I'm looking around the NHL for you know, players that might be available that are on the young side to come and possibly earn a spot on a team, you know, and it just Calgary doesn't really, you know, it's the same thing with when we traded Sam Bennett that, you know, like I even said that, you know, if I'm a GM, like he's number one on my list, but, you know, Calgary didn't need him at that time. And, you know, it, the change of scenery for him really worked out well for him, but, you know, it, it's one of those things. And, you know, it, it's always think- unfortunate when a situation like this happens, but it does happen. Do you think that we will see Valimaki stay with the team for the next 10 games? Or do you think he'll be assigned back to Stockton before they hit the ice? Uh, I, I could maybe see him staying for the Seattle game, but do you think he'll uh, actually. It's the 10th. Yeah, no, I think he'll probably be reassigned before the Seattle game. What do you think? Yeah, probably. I mean, they're pro- they're theoretically leaving the West Coast maybe today. It would make sense to just leave him in Seattle, fly back to California, then fly to Calgary and fly back to California. Yeah. Um, I think Mackey will probably stick around until Shillington's healthy. Yeah. Um. Yeah, actually, um, both Falamaki and Rajitska were reassigned today to Stockton. Okay, so. and, and that doesn't surprise me. And then, you know, I was going to mention Rajitska, but I don't think that there's much talk about there. I mean, he was the obvious choice to come up when we had a forward out, and Rajitska looked like Rajitska. I mean, he you, you know what you were going to get with him in the lineup. Yep. Matt, as we look ahead to the next 10 games that the Flames are playing, um, most of them at home, we have three games this week at home, then two games the week after at home. The Flames being so far ahead of the Oilers, what do you think we're going to see for player utilization? Do you think we're going to still see Johnny um, Lindholm and Kachuk being our number one line and getting more time than everybody else? Do you think that we'll see those guys maybe get shut down a little bit and other lines get their their time? Do you think Daryl just roll the lines? What are you expecting for the forward lines as we uh, move forward? Frankly, I'm expecting one through four, one through four, one through four, and just, just you rolling know, the lines. Yeah, and then power plays determining usage from therein. Unless you get in trouble, I think that makes sense. If you're in trouble, you might have to go back to you know giving more time to your top lines to get you out of your bind. Yeah, but especially like moving forward, like it. It's not 100% necessary to go, like, all out to win, like, every game. Uh, you want, How would you say? You want to me- both measure that while, you know, not going in, like, on a big funk heading into the playoffs either. So it's kind of, a, you know, managing everything so that way, like, you're being respectable. Like, I'm expecting them to probably win six or seven of the remaining 10 games and doing enough to win those games, but not, you know, trying to win eight or nine of them. If this team gets themselves up in a game, like say four to one and going into the third, do you think you'd see that, that top line shut down just to avoid injury? Because you see at this time of year where guys who are on a non playoff team are trying to make a name for themselves and might go after those players. Yeah, I could see that. Like, where they get, like, say instead of, like, five minutes worth of shifts, they get, like, two. And you start seeing, like, the second, third, fourth line guys getting more than 
But um, And especially what you were saying earlier with some of those lines needing to get going, I think there could be benefit to getting your other three lines or even those middle two lines going, almost swap your first line to your fourth line time and move everybody up by one. Yep. That makes perfect sense. Um, so that way, you know, like especially, like I think the mantra for the next 10 games is to get the middle six going um, and getting that chemistry going so that way, you're just not relying on the 430 goal scorers and that's it. And, you know, because, like, any team can focus on one line and do their best to try and shut that one line down. But if you're not getting anything from anybody else, like, Calgary becomes a little vulnerable in the playoffs. And, I w- and they're going to be even more vulnerable if they are missing that top line. So I think you've really got to manage those guys and w- and how you're using them and when you're using them and – you know, we want Johnny to get to 100, but I could even see here, Matt, in some of these games. I mean, I think they'll play him this week to get him to 100, but I wouldn't even be surprised if, you know, the Dallas game or the Vancouver game or even the Chicago-Nashville road trip, Johnny's out of lineup. You know, Matty's out of lineup. Like, that might be a time to put Rajishka in or, you know, put some of these other guys in and just give those guys the night off. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, especially as we were... Drawing towards the end of the season, I could, you know, certainly the Nashville Minnesota games at the end of the year. Um, I could. See I don't it. think you want to do it at home. I said Dallas, Vancouver, but I don't think you want to do it in front of your own fans. That would leave us Chicago, Nashville, Nashville, Minnesota, Winnipeg as five road games to maybe do that. Yeah, like the two Nashville games that. Well, it, it depends. Like, um, if it looks like Nashville, I think you want them there. Yeah, if you're playing Nashville in the playoffs, you want to have like everybody getting familiar with everybody, and you know, um, I think that would be a good preparation. And I think the Dallas game too, just because we're basically fifty fifty at this point for we're going to be playing Nashville or Dallas in the first round. So, you know, I think those games you're going to definitely see full lineups, but everybody else, I think it kind of doesn't matter and i think like the minnesota winnipeg games i think you'll see like the top line entirely shut down for those two and just uh you know recalls and you know like a spare defenseman playing forward and that kind of thing do you think that so let's go to that idea that idea of recalls who do you like who do you call up at this point i know you've wanted to see peltier all year if you're calling guys up not for injury and just to get them an nhl game who are you calling up on the forward side? Um, well, the recalls um, would be Rujitska, Peltier, um, Wolf for sure. Um, I would. Give, I think that Mackie counts as one. Yeah, and that right, would be my four three. Recalls. That would be my okay. three. And Rujitska, we've already called up, so he can be called up again. Yeah. Yeah, and then Wolf. I could see that. Okay, yeah. Because I think the Valimaki was an emergency call-up. Yeah. Actually, both Rujitska and uh, Valley were emergency recalls. Okay. So, yeah, I, I could. I think if you want to put Pelty in, I think, yeah, you could recall him. I Wolf, if you want to put him in, you could do that. I don't know what game you start him in, but uh, even if he's just sitting on the bench, I think it could just be good for him to be with the NHL team. Yeah. I, um, I, I, and, would and ac- I would actually expect Wolf to play the 29th game against Winnipeg. Well, let's go that way. So you're talking about Wolf playing against Winnipeg. What do you do from here on out with um, with Jacob Markstrom? I mean, the Flames are, you know, have their lead. They handedly have that lead. You've, I think Markstrom's looked tired in the last couple of weeks. So you've got to give him some rest. Where do you start to shut him down, and where do you start to play Vladar? Is this Vladar's net from here on out? Um, I think that you're going to see, like, I would kind of expect Markstrom to be facing more of the weaker teams. Um, like, uh, say this week, I would expect him to play the Seattle and Arizona game. And um, with Vladar getting Vegas um, next week, uh, Chicago, I would expect Markstrom. Um, uh, the two Nashville and Dallas games, I'd expect Vladar. Uh, marks from against so Vancouver. the opposite of what most teams would do. Yeah, because um, how would you say, like the other teams uh, that are good um, and possible playoff teams are going to probably be trying harder, and, which means more likely to crash to the net. And 
you know, uh, like Seattle, it, like those kind of teams, like they're kind of going through the motions, just trying to do like all of the other parts of their game. Well, that like, it's not like their playoff games are not on the line for those ones. So I, I would expect Markstrom to get the bevy of those games and then let uh, Vladar get the rest of like the actual playoff caliber teams. And I can definitely see putting Vladar in against Nashville. We saw the Flames do that against Colorado. I don't know if it was just kind of the scheduled loss or if it's, you know what, let's show them somebody different than they'll see in the playoffs. But I think there could be a strategy here. If, if you think Nashville is going to be our playoff opponent, to show Nashville Vladar twice instead of seeing Markstrom. Yeah, same with uh, Dallas. I'd, I'd have Vladar play, you know, because we're going to be able to be playing either Nashville or Dallas unless weird stuff happens. So, you know, uh, those three for sure, I would expect Vladar to be in for sure. Yeah, it makes sense. I'm, I didn't think of it the way you did. I can see where you're coming from of give Vladar the playoff caliber teams and get him playoff caliber ready. Um, I'm just wondering if like, yeah, I, I just don't know how many more games I give Markstrom. Like I'm thinking of the 10, I'd probably want Markstrom in no more than three more if I could avoid it and give Vladar the majority of these 10 starts. Yeah. Well, basically like, uh, I'm booking ending each week with Markstrom with, uh, the Tuesday and Saturday games this week, the Monday and Saturday games next week, and then the Thursday game against Minnesota. Uh, with Vladar playing all the inner part of the week and Wolf playing the last one. Yeah, like I could see Vladar against Seattle. Or sorry, I could see Markstrom against Seattle, I mean, like you said. I could see, just because I think Daryl would want him there, I could see Markstrom play Vegas, because I think Daryl's going to want to put his best goalie out there. And then I think you play Vladar Arizona, you play Marks from Chicago, Vladar Nashville, and I'd probably just run Vladar from that point. Nashville, Dallas, Vancouver, Nashville, and then Minnesota, Winnipeg. You don't even I wouldn't even take uh I wouldn't even take Markstrom on that trip and just let Vladar and Wolf split that one. Well, the problem uh with giving um Markstrom too much of a break is that he might get rusty. Uh, from not playing for, like, two weeks. Because usually, like, after the last game of the season, there's usually, like, four or five days uh, before game one. So that's why, you know, like, my thoughts were to at least give him the Minnesota game so at least um, he's, you know, there um, and kind of fresh at, at towards the end. But, like, that would be pretty much the only game of that week that I'd expect him to play. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how they manage it. Because, yeah, yeah it can, as we were saying, it can go a lot of ways, right? Yeah. It, it's one of those that will be very interesting to see. And, you know, I think um, it it's weird saying this, but I think it's actually important that Wolf gets a game in the NHL. Um, it, and I'm that's why I penciled in the Winnipeg game, just because of the fact that Worst case scenario, if there are injuries in the to the goaltenders, that you have somebody who's at least played an NHL game available, <laughs> you know, because like you look at like all the rest of the organization's goalies and like there's nobody that's even played a single game in the NHL, and you know, just for worst case scenario, at least like Wolf wouldn't be getting thrown to the wolves, so to speak. Um, uh, if, you know, something were to happen to either Marks from Orvaladar or both. Um, so, you know, we, we do have AHL backup, Adam Werner, who's played two games with the Colorado avalanche. Okay. Well, still, didn't look great in those two games, but has played two games in 2019, 2020. Yeah. So, uh, it's one of those where, you know, at least, uh, getting a game for him so he can tell, okay, this is what I'm going to be dealing with um, if I need to. And a reward for his good season, frankly, uh, would also help. And, you know, see how things shake out with him as well. And, you know, hope not to see him again until next year. <laughs> That's right. Go down, tend the net for Stockton. Do do your job down there. Knock on wood up here. And, yeah, we'll see you, we'll see you at training camp, kid. Yeah. Um, do you make any changes to the defensive pairings? Um, 
it, when I think so- the only thing I would do is like we talked about with the top line is just give Hannafin Anderson less time if we can. Yeah, I, I would balance it more where like one two three one two three, um, and then special teams dictating the rest of the ice time. Um, and yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, I would take Zadorov out in as many games as I can and put Stone in there. Yeah, I think you're That's gonna a big see change I'd make. Um like all four of Mackie, Stone, uh Zadorov and Goodbranson shifting in and out of the lineup, especially until Shillington's better. Um so that way like everybody's loose and you know, 'cause like the, the two third pairing guys have been getting a little sloppy as of late. Um, Zadorov more so. And so just being more fresh, especially because, like, we're playing a lot of games. Um, you know, like, 10 games in, the, like, 18 days is a ridiculous amount of games. So, you know, it's tough. And we, we have more healthy bodies on the blue line to cycle in and out than we do on the forward ranks. Yeah, and making sure that everybody's healthy and ready to go uh, well healthy as they can be and ready to go for game one is the most important thing and that pretty much wraps up this week matt what do you think yeah um it's just more looking ahead than anything this week so like uh, more or less like everything's been resolved the flames are likely winning the division uh, um it's just a matter before the the letter goes in front of our name and then you know uh, okay who are we playing and like it, it's you know we're kind of in that uh you know play the jeopardy theme song you know just waiting and waiting oh okay that's what, what we're doing now <laughs> and you know just gotta wait and see the team had four games last week. I thought we would win against San Jose and Seattle and lose to LA and Arizona. You thought we'd win LA, Arizona and Seattle and lose to San Jose. So neither of us won the predictions. The Flames swept that road trip. This week they've got a three game homestand back where they used to be playing for the last couple months. On Tuesday night, the Calgary Flames will play the Seattle Kraken in the Cell Dome, a 7 p.m. start time, back to what we're used to. Thursday night, the Vegas Golden Knights come to town a 7 p.m. start time. And then Saturday night, the Arizona Coyotes are in town. That's an 8 p.m. start night for the, for the or 8 p.m. start time that night for the Hockey Night in Canada late game. Matt, we got three games on the table. I'm going to give you my predictions first this week. Okay. I'm, predi- I'm predicting a sweep. It's an easy week. I think you get a sweep. That Vegas game is going to be the tough one, and I'll predict a loss because I was going to say sweep myself, but... That Vegas game, you know, like Vegas is making a huge push to making the playoffs. They're now only two points behind LA uh, with the game in hand on the Kings. So it's, and they have the tiebreaker on LA as well. So it's uh, not looking too good for the LA Kings at the moment. And, you know, they have to pull out a little nosedive that they've gotten themselves into. And, you know, with Vegas getting healthy, like they're if they actually pass LA and are playing at Edmonton in the first round, like that's going to be an easy series for Vegas, and that means that we have to deal with them in the second round if we get on. So you know, it, I think it's very important that the Flames win that game uh, to try and stunt Vegas as much as possible and hope that LA can figure their stuff out. So that way we don't have to deal with Vegas at all. I agree. And I think that's definitely going to be the game. It's going to be tough. And I think that we might see the Flames have some trouble there just because they have, you know, two Seattle games before that. They've got the Arizona game after that. I think that they might sort of get into this rhythm of playing good enough, which isn't going to work against Vegas. Yeah. And, you know, like looking ahead, like um, one good thing for, uh, LA is that their remaining schedule they have one game against Colorado and that's the only playoff team that they face uh, so uh, LA you know if they don't manage to make the playoffs like that's kind of embarrassing for them because like they're playing a lot of deadbeats over the next couple of weeks themselves so we'll see 
and these three, and then there's two more games on the 21st and 23rd at the Dome. So if you haven't been to the Dome or still want to go before playoffs when it's going to be hard to get a ticket, make sure you grab one for these five games because the Dome is quite the environment these days. If you haven't been this year, it's loud, it's fun. You want to be part of this energy. And I have to imagine tickets for Arizona are not going to be all that expensive. Tickets for Seattle aren't going to be all expensive. So now might be your chance, Flames fans, to get in the Dome one last time and uh, cheer on the Flames. Yeah, which, you know, I'm very much looking forward to the playoffs to see the Dome getting just absolutely raucous uh, for uh, game one and, you know, see how things go from there. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how much the, how loud the building gets when Gaudreau gets number 100 it's going to be fun. Matt, it's Dome Sweet Dome this week, and we will talk to you next week before the Flames go back on the road to head to Chicago. Yep, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.